Hi everyone, welcome back. My name is Luca and I am out here with the two sea stars because after the last video that I did with my first test results and impressions of the S30, I received so many questions that I thought it's better to just address them in a video rather than me typing out the same response to every single person. An overwhelming number of people wanted to know if it was possible to see planets with the sea star S30 or S50. Let's test both telescopes on multiple planets tonight. We have Venus, Saturn, Jupiter, and in a little bit also Mars is coming up. So it is a very good night to test that. Let's get into it. Obviously the first one I will start with is Venus because it's about to go down it's right there. Okay, so uh, I have already pointed the S30 on it. I tried to click on autofocus, but the autofocus just doesn't seem to work well enough for planets because after all this struggle that it went on for like, I want to say a minute, it ended up with the most out of focus disc I've ever seen. So I recommend that you enable the manual controls for the focus. Uh, you zoom in as much as you can and then just manually focus on Venus. If you use like the automatic controls, you're not going to be able to see any details or shape whatsoever because it's just way too bright. You have to go into the manual controls. I would take down the gain all the way and then see where you have to be with the exposure time. Venus is a notoriously difficult planet to image, even with a large telescope. It is very bright and it has low surface contrast. So the best we can hope for with these telescopes is that we're able to see the phase that Venus is in. Similarly to the moon, Venus shows phases. Currently it is in the evening sky. So the right hand side of it, as you're looking at it from the Northern hemisphere is illuminated. So you kind of want to see like a crescent or like half moon shape. Anyway, I wouldn't spend that much time on Venus. I'm more interested to see if there's anything visible at all for Saturn. Okay, so let's start with the S50. It is centered and um, you can see that it is Saturn, um, but let's see if we can make it any better than this. I go into video mode, raw. I will enable the target correction and I will put everything to manual because I kind of expect to see some rings, if that makes sense. I feel like this might be the best focus. The thing is, it doesn't look like much, but the idea is that we will take a video and then do the stacking on the computer. And the sea star being a little bit undersampled, we should be able to use a drizzle integration to hopefully achieve slightly better results. While that is running, I will also set this up. So let's just see how to do that from scratch. I have connected to the sea star and I will go into solar system mode, select Saturn, go to and go gazing and it should find Saturn for me. Okay, so we have Saturn in the middle. That is literally a little speck of nothing. I will enable target correction, switch to video, switch to raw. We go to manual as always. I want to see if we can get it into better focus than this. Okay, I feel like that's as good as it's going to get. You can, when it's a good moment, you can see where the rings are. I will just start a recording of this. I will be using the four times mode. I mean, obviously it doesn't magnify more because the focal length is given, but it is just doing an ROI, uh, like a region of interest in the center of the image so that it looks bigger in the image. It's the same as cropping the image afterwards. So let's just start. So Saturn is running. See Jupiter that is very nice and high up and I have much better hopes for that one. Okay, we have Jupiter centered. That is exactly what you would expect. You see Jupiter with the four Galilean moons. Manual mode, zero gain, and probably one millisecond. Oh, and we can actually see some resemblance of banding. Let's see if I can get the focus better and get some more detail. Okay, and I will start a video. Ooh, it's cold. I think I might do like an HDR and I will do a longer exposure for the Galilean moons and then I will blend them together to see if we can get a nice image because realistically that's your best bet of getting a nice planetary image with such a small piece of equipment. If you have some sort of like a, a composition, either the planet with something else or, or with the moons, because I highly doubt that you're gonna resolve a lot of details on 
the surface of any of the planets. If you look up online how to image Jupiter, you will find recommendations that the video should not be longer than a minute or two minutes. That is because as it rotates, you risk washing out details of Jupiter. I don't believe that here that will be an issue. I think I will take like a five minute video just because it's not like we're seeing that much detail. So I would be happy if I got a nice image of the bands, even if the bands are a little washed out longitudinally. Time to switch to the S30. I will be switching to Jupiter. You can clearly see that there's Jupiter there in the wide angle lens. Um, it would probably be faster if I didn't do the place solve and just let the user select the planet. Okay, we have Jupiter. Once again, we see the four Galilean moons. That is less than I had hoped because I don't see any banding whatsoever. I, I, I think, what are you doing? I think though I have to accept this because it is kind of in line with what you would expect from three centimeters of optics. I mean, <laughs> this is not a limitation of whether it is a sea star or how good the instrument has been implemented or any of that. It is just physics that you can't resolve too much planetary detail with such a small lens. Regardless, I will be taking a video and I will see if stacking it on the computer, I'm able to get any detail out. While the S30 is shooting Jupiter, let me just address some of the other questions. I mentioned in the previous video that I was a bit disappointed that the S30 didn't come with a bag, but actually ZWO confirmed that it was just like a temporary thing that they did so that they could send the test pieces out as soon as possible. And the following week they mailed me this little bag, which I have to say I'm pleasantly surprised by because it is just done so much nicer than the one of the S50. I don't know how well you can see it, but this is all like this um, plasticky material, whereas this one is, I mean, it's the same material, but it's covered in fabric and it just looks nicer. So that is confirmed that it's included. Other questions that I got so many times is which one of these I would choose. And a lot of people also asked which one of these or the dwarf three I would choose. And it's not really a which one is better situation between these two because it's just a different field of view. So I think it depends on that. That said, if I had to choose one, I would probably stick to the S50. And that is because I tend to like smaller targets. And also I like the larger aperture. I would choose the S30 if I was looking for something that I want to take around with me on a trip and possibly even doing daytime photography. And I would choose the Dwarf 3 if you really want to polar line. This is the answer now. However, I did see some posts in a couple of online forums that suggested that ZWO is actively working on supporting polar alignment on the sea stars. And at that point, probably the answer will change because the dwarf costs as much as the S50 does, but is more comparable to the S30 in diameter. So at that point, it doesn't really have a selling point. And at that point, I would probably go for one of these, even if you want to polar line. Um, next question, are you able to take like Milky Way images or things like that with the wide angle camera? Of course you can, because you can physically point the wide angle camera at the Milky Way and take pictures in scenery mode, but you can't take tracked Milky Way images with it. If I mean, I, I think that's what people were asking. And then somebody asked, is it safe to observe a solar eclipse with the included solar filter? And the answer is yes, because the solar filter is safe enough for you to observe the sun when it is not eclipsed. And when it is eclipsed, there is just less light. So for sure, it, it is going to be perfectly safe. We have a partial solar eclipse coming up in Europe at the end of March. So Mars is up. Um, Mars is tiny, so I will not even try it with the S30, but I will try to see if anything is visible with the S50. It is also obviously very low still. It is probably like 20 degrees high, maybe. We have Mars centered. Yeah, it's tiny. I think this is just it. I will take a quick video, but I'm very doubtful that I will be able but I'm very doubtful that I will be able to extract a lot of detail here. Okay, so I have downloaded all the files from both C stars and I have processed them. So we have the processed images and we can compare them and see how they are.
the processing workflow that I use is a very basic one for, for planetary. Um, if you look up any planetary processing guide, this is what it will tell you. So what I did is I used auto stacker for the stacking. Since the planet is still so tiny in the field of view, um, I also made it run through PIPP, which is another software that just essentially serves for stabilizing um, the tracking that was not really needed, but then I would use it to like crop it out so that there's a much smaller video to then actually do the stacking on because it makes it much more efficient and much faster. So without further ado, let's have a look at what the pictures look like. I have created this like montage where I put all the planets next to one another so that we can start seeing them. If we start out from the S50, uh, we can start with Jupiter. And this is honestly as good as I think realistically it can get with the size of the optics that we have. I mean, you can recognize that this is Jupiter. You see the, the bands, uh, obviously don't see any further detail. Um, and then, like I mentioned, I did like an HDR situation. So I have the moons next to it. And I think with the moons, if you zoom out a little bit, it kind of gives like a nice idea. Of course, there was a fourth moon somewhere here, but um, it was not fitting into the field of view. So we just see three of the moons. Moving on, we have Venus. I, I think that this is about as good as it can get with this telescope. So. I'm not all that upset about how this came out. And then we have Saturn. <laughs> Saturn is a bit disappointing if you look at it because you don't see the rings, but that is also because we are in this unfortunate period where the rings are almost side on. So I think if I try to adjust this a little bit, yes, they, they are there. So you, you see that it is Saturn, but it is not easy to you know, show them in a nice way. And then finally we have Mars and not surprisingly, you have no detail there whatsoever. You see that it is a disc, not just a dot, and you see that it is red, but you're not able to see any of the darker surface detail and you're not able to see the polar ice caps either. And then we get to the S30 and I have to say it is disappointing, not because I was expecting better because you do have a 30 millimeter lens that's just objectively not enough for planets, but I was somehow hoping that via some sort of miraculous way we will be able to see something. Um, this is Jupiter I and mean, you can see the stripes there. I mean, the difference here is very large. You can definitely recognize that this is Jupiter versus this is a dot which may or may not have stripes on it and then we have the moons adding the moons to it you get a better idea but you, even the moons somehow are not round after the stacking I, I don't know what happened there i think that while this is not a nice image there's a lot we can learn from it both astronomically and in terms of astrophotography you see that the respective sizes of jupiter and the little moons are very very different Whereas here, they are, are more similar. That is because you have such a small lens that is not able to resolve the differences that well. And then what you might also notice that the relative positions between the moons and Jupiter, especially this moon here, now I don't know which one that is, is very different. And that is because 20 minutes passed between when I took this picture and this picture. And if we check it out in Sky Safari, I go back to the exact time that this was taken. Yes we can see that indeed Io moved that much closer to the planet. And then moving on, let's see Venus. Also here, the only thing you can see here where on the S50, you could tell the shape of the planet. Whereas here, you can just tell that it's not round, that it's like an oblong shape, but you cannot tell that it's like a semicircle or what kind of phase it is in. Finally, we have Saturn that is just I mean, that is a truly sad image. Um, this is also, we're not able to s appreciate this as we should. There is really no information to recover here. So that is it for the results. It is mostly in line with what I had expected. If your primary goal is to image planets, which one should you choose? Neither one of them. Um, if your primary goal is to image planets, there is a minimum diameter that you need. 
I would say at the very least six inches or 150 millimeters. This can be any sort of a telescope. If I had the budget of five, six hundred dollars for the S50, but my goal was to image planets, what I would personally do is go on the used market and find the largest Dobsonian telescope that I can find with whatever my budget is. And I would try to track the planets manually. You will get much better results than doing this. If you have the sea star for what it was intended for, which is uh, deep sky objects, for sure you can, you know, have some fun with a little bit of creativity. Like I said, maybe doing some compositions, trying to see the planet with the moons or stuff like that. For sure you can do it. I think with the S30 that is truly a waste of time because you're not going to resolve any detail. Same for, I think there were a lot of people asking if you could track the ISS. Tracking it theoretically should be possible. In practice, I think it would be extremely difficult. If you remember last time I tracked a plane with the S30 um, and that took a few attempts to, to try to get that and, and the ISS moves much faster than a plane. That said, with a little bit of patience and some luck, you would be able to do it, but you would not be able to resolve the size or any details on the ISS with the S30. With the S50, you probably would be, but with the fact that you don't have the wide angle camera, you pretty much have no chance of trying to find the ISS at the speed at which it is moving with a longer focal length and then you need time to actually draw that tracking rectangle around the ISS. So I think that would be nearly impossible to do. But with the S50, what you could do is an ISS transit. So when it's transiting the moon or the sun, you could do a high speed video when you know, um, if you go on transitfinder.com, it tells you when you can expect the ISS to pass in front of the moon or the sun from your location. And then that way you would be able to get some images where I think you would be able to resolve some detail of the ISS. That answers most of the questions that I received with respect to the S30 and the S50. I hope that those of you who had some of these same questions found this helpful and uh, happy new year. This is the first video that I'm posting this year. I hope everyone has had a lovely start to the year and I wish you all a lot of clear skies for 2025.